everyone, it's Jessie from Bear Flower Farm and today I want to talk about something that really should be talked about a little bit more often and that is pests. Now I bet you when whoever sold you on the idea of flower farming did so, they never talked to you about all of the pests that you would encounter and this year I feel like it's been worse than normal. We probably say this every single year, but with the mild winter that we had, I feel like that the aphids, the thrips infestation has just been completely out of control and I know I'm not the only one. So I thought it would be a good time for me to talk a little bit about just my philosophy of pest management, but also this broader topic of insects and plants as a whole, their relationship. I'm also gonna talk about why I don't buy ladybugs, but I would buy something like beneficial nematodes, my thoughts around uh, bricks and soil health, uh, helping prevent pest outbreaks, and then finally wrapping everything up. So one thing that you may not know about me is that before I ever started flower farming, I was actually deeply interested in insects and their relationship with plants, especially with vegetables, because I was vegetable farming. And I remember the very first time I realized there were aphids on my lettuce. You kind of just think that you throw seed into the ground, you grow lettuce, you grow fruit, and you know, like you just eat it. But no, there's obviously pest pressure. And once I started realizing that, oh, it's not as simple as just growing something and putting fertilizer into the ground, there's other things that you might need to be combating, such as pests, I went down a bit of of a rabbit hole and a lot of what I do or what I'm interested in revolves around sustainability. So at the end of the day, I have a no spray mentality. I hope that I can convince others to reduce their use of sprays or insecticides. And I'm hoping that a video like this can at least give you a little bit more information so that you are a little bit more informed the next time you come at, to that crossroads in terms of do I spray, do I wait, do I do something else? So with that all being said, let's get started. In order to talk about this topic in a more knowledgeable way, we need to first talk about the relationship that insects have with plants. So let's start with insects first. Believe it or not, out of all of the animals on the planet, about 80% are actually insects. So there's a lot of insects out there. Now only 1% of that 80% is actually harmful insects, which means that the rest are benign or beneficial. Now in the f flower farming world, I think we really care about two, ty two types of insects, right? We care about pests, which are undesirable, and we care about the beneficials. Now pests typically either chew through leaves or they suck the moisture out of plants, or they cause enough cosmetic damage for us to not be able to sell stems. So that is typically what the pest category looks like. The beneficials are typically those insects that feast on those pests or help us take care of the problem. But the relationship between insects and plants is such, it, like it's so complex that I think that neither could fully thrive without the other. So when we think about an insect, in order for an insect to live, it's kind of like a human. They need protein and they also need carbohydrates. They can get their protein in one of two ways. They can get their protein through uh, other prey. So kind of like a human eating meat. Uh, so an insect eating another type of insect or even its own type. Uh, or they can get it from pollen. Pollen also has certain types of protein that they can't get from other insects. So at a certain point in an insect's life cycle, they are also going to need carbohydrates and they get that from the nectar in a plant. So overall, an insect cannot live without plants because it really needs the carbohydrates from the nectar as well as certain proteins that they can't get from other sources. Now, from the plant's perspective, the plant can actually send out what we call an SOS to alert the beneficials that, hey, there are pests on me that are sucking moisture out of me, that are harming me. And that SOS basically gets emitted either a few hundred feet to a couple of inches away, and it alerts the beneficials to come in to help resolve that issue. So there's that symbiotic relationship between 
pests and plants that exist. And this is just one of many different types of relationships that exist. Now, I talked about how an insect can basically get its food source from a plant as well as prey. In the most ideal situation, the plant has both the pest on there as well as the nectar and the pollen, or in a better case scenario, that insect can fly within a certain vicinity or a growing area to seek all of that. So our goal is to facilitate an environment where that insect or that beneficial predator does not have to waste a lot of energy searching for the different sources of food. Ideally, they have it all within a, uh, a, a small location, so that way they're spending more time eating and reproducing and helping us with our problems. So this starts to get into some of the other questions that I typically see or that people ask of me. The first of those questions is basically just, you know, would you consider spraying something like a horticultural oil, um, something that is organic? And the answer here is no for me. And it's because unless if you know of a substance out there that uh, discriminates only against pests or a specific type of pest or insect, most sprays are going to have some sort of unintended consequence so even just one spray is going to have collateral damage. So in the case of a horticultural oil, uh, you know, if you spray the underside of a leaf, which is where a lot of the larvae are, you can end up suffocating that larva and basically coating it in oil and killing that larva, right? So there's always that collateral damage piece where you spend all of this time trying to build up your beneficial population. You see pests come in and then you spray and then, you know, you kind of take five steps back when you took one step forward. The other question I get is, where do I get my ladybugs from? And the answer is, I don't get them from anywhere. They're natural, right? My goal is to cultivate an environment where the lady bugs want to come in. And in order to do that, I have to supply them with a food source in the form of pests. So uh, a couple of times this happened throughout the season. It's only June right now. And I've seen this process happen at least three times. So the first is actually on my fever few. I had an aphid infestation. Um, I'm pretty sure it was some sort of black aphid because there were ants all over. For those of you who don't know, aphids and ants have this like symbiotic relationship. The ants, when they're crawling all over the plant, are not eating the aphids. They're actually using the aphids um, as kind of like a, what do you call it? The aphids secrete uh, a sweet type of uh, excrement and the ants are eating off of that. So a lot of times you'll know if it's aphids because you see ants around kind of harvesting that <laughs> excrement. So um, I saw a lot of aphids and ants on my fever few and my strategy was I'm gonna give it time. This was back in May. And I'm gonna put some footage up here and you can see it is coated in aphids. Uh, these were stems that I, I basically was just gonna say, I'm not gonna use any of this and I'm gonna use it as a food source for the beneficials to come in. And lo and behold, I had ladybugs. Um, these are ladybugs that I assume are native to my area. I did not buy them. And they not only started eating some of those aphids, but they started reproducing. And they started uh, hatching eggs and those eggs turned into larva. And ladybug larvae are very, very good at taking care of aphids. They eat a lot of aphids. So this is reason number one why I don't buy ladybugs. It's actually reason number two, but basically adult ladybugs don't eat a lot of aphids. If you wanted to buy ladybugs, then you should really buy larva because that's what consumes the most amount of aphids. Um, but going back to ladybug piece, the main reason why I don't buy ladybugs is because there's like 6,000 species of ladybugs out there of which 500 are in North America alone. And I have no idea what species is being sent to me. And it's very likely that the species that's being sent to me is not native to my area because a lot of the ladybugs harvested in uh, North America come from California. I live in New Jersey. California is on the other side of the country. I have no idea what unintended consequences there are in terms of bringing in a non-native ladybug species to take care of my pet 
less problem. And add on to the other fact that a lot of times these ladybugs are being harvested when they are hibernating. So that means that when they wake up, they're actually programmed to fly. Ladybugs have wings. So it's very likely when you release ladybugs in an open field, they're just gonna fly away. This might be a little bit different if you're growing underneath a structure where, you know, if they fly, they're still within your greenhouse or within, or within your hoop house. But in the great outdoors, they're likely just gonna go somewhere else. And I have no idea you know, what that is doing to my neighborhood when I bring in that non-native species. There's actually a very good YouTube video that Brie from Blossom and Branch Farms uh, did on this recently that you should definitely check out. I will link it in the description below. She talks a lot in detail about just, you know, why she doesn't buy ladybugs and other pests, but, or sorry, and other beneficials. So going back to my fever feud, the ladybugs, or the native ladybugs that I naturally had attracted took care of the issue with my fever few in the aphids. Now, what ended up happening was a couple of weeks later, my fever few got overtaken by thrips. And again, you know, the natural cycle is happening. I'm seeing pirate bugs come in. I saw green lace wings and the ladybug larva also will eat thrips. Unfortunately, I think my thrips outbreak is so bad that the beneficials are not going to be able to resolve the issue. And thrips have a very, very fast reproduction cycle. So I actually did a video on it. Um, if you have not seen it, it is here and linked below. So I would definitely check that out if I were you. But, you know, I say this because I wanna be upfront that you know, nature took care of my aphid problem, but thus far, I don't think it's going to take care of my thrips problem. And I always tell people you have to wait at least two to three weeks for you to see any type of progress. It took about three weeks for my aphids issue to clear for my fever few. Um, so I really should give it another week or two for my thrips. The problem is the thrips reproduction cycle is about two to three weeks at this time of year. So I'm still a little bit conflicted in terms of what to do. I'll talk a little bit about that later. But another place where I saw the same process happening was on my Rudbeckia. My Rudbeckia have been an aphid magnet this year. I talked to a couple of local growers and they said the same thing. I have no idea why they're attracted to my Rudbeckia specifically, but they are. And in this plant, it was just, it, it was disgusting. It was infested once again with black aphids. And lo and behold, this is what it looks like two weeks later. The problem is not fully taken care of, but you can see there are many ladybugs here. There's even some larva and they have taken care of some of the problem. Now on my fever few, it's completely gone. I can't even see where the those stems were that were infested on my Rudbeckia. I would expect the same uh, result at, uh, in another week or maybe two weeks for that progress to show. One thing I want to point out here, I grow in a 40 by 90 foot area. So that also includes walkways. That is not a huge growing space. And in order to have a no spray type of mentality where I let nature take care of stuff, it means that I am going to have to let certain crops fail and not use those stems. And so that has already happened with my snaps, with my fever few. So two of my three fever few varieties have been completely overtaken by thrips. The third variety, the magic single is also starting to get overtaken by thrips. So all of that is gonna have to go. And that is just par for the course. Um, it is an expectation that I have that I am going to have some sort of, um, I guess attrition is the word here, where I have unusable stems. So luckily I have other stuff blooming where I can still fulfill my CSA orders. I can still sell to my floral co-op, but that is something for you to consider, which is, you know, if you want to take this route of no spray and letting nature take care of itself, you have to be willing to sacrifice some of the stems that you are growing. And hopefully over time, as you cultivate a uh, better soil and as you attract more of those beneficial predators that are going to come in and overwinter in your area, you can have a faster cycle in terms of nature taking care of those pests and potentially not have to sacrifice, you know, whole rows of stems and not being able to use them. Another topic that I want to talk about is bricks. So I have been using a refractometer since, God, I got this 
I think around like during COVID. So that was what, 2020. So I've had this for close to three years and I've used it primarily on my vegetables. So for those of you who don't know what a refractometer is, um, you basically put juice on here. So let's take, for example, like a grape. You can squeeze juice out of a grape, put it on this lens over here. You put the flap on and then you look inside and you look at the reading. And the higher the number, the higher the sugar content, for lack of better words, uh, it is. And so I'm really dumbing down bricks as a whole, but I think the easiest way to think about it is bricks measures the sugar content in a plant and the higher the sugar content in the plant, the less appetizing it is to a sucking pest. So something like a thrip, which sucks moisture out of a plant, leaf or stem, um, it, will, it will be less likely to want to feast on a plant with a high bricks. And the way that a plant can get a high bricks is by cultivating good soil health, by making sure it is healthy and all that stuff. So you use a refractometer to measure that level of bricks in a plant. And a refractometer is actually typically used for people who do fermentation at home. Um, I used it because I grew a lot of vegetables and I wanted to see if the bricks argument held weight. And I can attest that yes, a tomato with a higher bricks definitely tastes better than a tomato with a lower bricks. I mean, you know, the difference between like a six and a seven is not very meaningful, but the difference between like a two and an eight is meaningful. Now, that being said, there are a couple of things about bricks that I'm still confused about. I feel like the research or the studies are still a bit in its infancy. And so one of them is the fact that you can take a bricks reading from the same plant at different times of the day, and it's going to show a different number. So if the theory that a higher bricks number for a plant means that it is less likely to be overtaken by pests, then wouldn't that mean that that plant is more susceptible to pests during certain parts of the day versus the other? Um, and then the second thing is that I think that there are some people who think that a higher bricks means that they can pre prevent pest outbreaks. Now, going back to what I said earlier, insects and plants have a relationship. You technically don't even want to have zero pests because if you don't have any pests, you don't have any food source for your beneficials. You will ultimately have some sort of pest. I mean, it's inevitable. So when you have that pest outbreak, it's gonna be harder for you to naturally get rid of those pests if there is no food source for the beneficials or the beneficials don't realize that, hey, I can come back here and there is a reliable food source for me. So that part of the bricks argument kind of doesn't make sense to me because if I have really, really good soil health, a really good ecosystem, I have this balance between pests and beneficials with the beneficials coming in to feast on the pests as a food source, you know, this is the natural cycle, then where does that bricks piece play in? Because hypothetically speaking, if I have good soil and healthy plants, I should have plants with higher bricks. I would love to hear in the comments below if you have found any additional research research that talks about this, if you have any personal experience, that kind of stuff. I will say that the other place where the bricks uh, theory holds its weight is the fact that a healthier plant is definitely going to be more resilient against disease and against pests, especially earlier in the season. But my analogy for someone is it's it's like humans. I'm I'm going to do my best to work out. I'm going to do my best to eat healthy and I'm going to do my best to take care of myself. But I am not immortal. I will eventually succumb to death either through disease or either through old age. And if you look at something like a tomato, I have yet to meet a tomato plant that has lived indefinitely, uh, assuming it's in an area that doesn't have any frost, tomatoes will inevitably succumb to some sort of disease, right? Really the longest living type of plant are trees out there. So again, the, the theory of bricks and having a really, really high bricks and healthy plant, I think is a really, really interesting theory and something that needs uh, to be tested and for more people to share their experiences with bricks.
So you're probably wondering what are some things you can do to attract beneficials as well as create that good soil health for your plants. And I think that a lot of it is really intuitive, but it's really creating a diverse environment for your plants. So, you know, if you have a full field of dahlias or of sunflowers or of, as of roses, you know, that's not a lot of variety in there. At the end of the day, different insects can sometimes be generalists in terms of being a beneficial predator. They can feast on many different types of pests, but you also have a lot of pests that need a specialized predator. And the only way that you can attract a whole host of diverse beneficial insects is to have diverse planting. So different colors, different varieties. Um, one thing that has been heavily researched is the role of natives and their ability to attract a wide range of beneficials. And so something like yarrow is really, really good in attracting lacewings, ladybugs, uh, damselbugs. So uh, when I planted yarrow this year, I definitely noticed a significant increase in ladybugs. I think that the ladybugs came because of the yarrow and even to a certain extent because of the fever few. Um, but then there are also other studies that are showing that introduced species uh, that are not necessarily native but have naturalized are also very good at attracting beneficials and a wide variety of them. So at the end of the day, it's really a lot of research that you might need to do to see what you want to plant and whether or not that is going to help attract that diverse uh, beneficials that you are looking for. Um, some other things that you can do are having weeds is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, weeds are typically great as an alternative uh, host site for overwintering beneficials. That being said, I also have a feeling that the clover weeds in my uh, in my field, in my grass were a great destination for the thrips to overwinter. So there's a bit of that double edged sore there. But at, look, at the end of the day, weeds, I think, have a net benefit, uh, even though they might have hosted my thrips. They keep the soil covered. Um, they prevent erosion. They help retain moisture. When you think about what happens naturally in nature, so think about a forest there's always some sort of covering on the ground, whether it's a plant or a weed or fallen leaves, so live mulch, right? You want to try to replicate that. And when you think about how nature structures what it looks like, it's not like we've got rows of the same crop. There's no monocropping in a forest. It's all of random diverse sproutings of different types of varieties of plants. And so, that is how that natural system looks like. So to a certain extent, our fields, our farms, our gardens can only replicate nature up to a certain point because we have those kind of constraints, right? Like you're not going to plant 50 different types of plants in the same row because that would be really inefficient and um, things might outcompete each other, that kind of stuff. So there's a limitation there, but you should, all, you should definitely think about what are some elements that you can take from nature and replicate that in your farm, in your field to encourage that kind of diversity? So at the end of the day, when I think about my objectives, my objectives are I don't want to use any kind of spray because I don't want to take that one step forward, five steps back. I grow quite a bit of vegetables in our field where I also plant flowers. So I don't want to deter any beneficials or kill any beneficials, especially the pollinators, because I need them for my tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. Um, and not to mention, if I'm growing food there that I'm eating, I also obviously don't want to be eating any uh, residue from sprays that I may be using in my field. But I think for me, what I really want to be able to do is create a natural way for nature to take care of my pest infestations. And I think one of the most concerning things that I've read is that since the 1970s, uh, basically the time in which it takes plants to bloom, for insects to wake up from their dormancy has accelerated. And every single decade, it's about two and a half days earlier. So over the last 50 years, um, plants and insects are waking up 
about half a month earlier than normal. And with climate change going on, that type of uh, of trend is not going to stop. It's not going to reverse. So what that means is that we may be seeing these pests earlier. Um, our flowering cycles might look a little bit different. So it's really important, I think, for us to think about what that management looks like in terms of pest control, um, especially if you don't want to spray. All right, so finally, going back to my fever few thrips infestation. Um, I am still waiting on what to do because we have a lot of rain coming and rain is good in terms of trying to get rid of thrips. Again, watch my video here if you haven't yet about thrips, I explain why. But I have a bed of snaps that overwintered from last year and some of those snaps, especially the Potomac apple blossoms that you see over here were from the summer of last year. So they had two bloom cycles or they had one bloom cycle last year and then a bloom cycle this year. They were so light green in their leaves that I knew something was wrong and lo and behold they were overtaken by thrips. Luckily my campanula did not have any thrips but they were done. So what I did yesterday was I weed whacked down everything and my plan was to solarize that area. Solar Solarizing basically just means putting a clear uh, plastic film over the area. So think about the stuff that you use to protect your your plants over the winter, that kind of plastic, not Agrabond fabric, but plastic, plastic, or like polytunnel plastic. So believe it or not, you can get to above 100 degrees, like 125 degrees, if you have direct sunlight uh, hitting that, that film and assuming that that film is tightly contained. So you're using a lot of bags of sand or rocks, whatever, to keep it airtight. Um, 125 degrees is more than enough to kill thrips and any other pathogens. So the goal was to do that, except poor planning, because this is the one week it seems out of the season so far where it's going to be all cloudy and raining. So um, I am still planning on solarizing, assuming that next week the temperatures are better. But in the meantime, I am or I have ordered beneficial nematodes. Now, I would buy beneficial nematodes, but I wouldn't buy ladybugs because beneficial nematodes are actually, they can be cultured in a lab. So it was really surprising to me because I saw BASF as the producer of the nematodes. And for those of you who don't know, BASF is a chemicals company. It's a German chemicals manufacturer. I was like, that is interesting. Why is BASF the maker of these nematodes? So it turns out that they have this whole group that is centered around creating biocontrol agents for things like this. So the the beneficial nematodes are coming. They can be cultured. There's a ton of different types of beneficial nematodes. It's a bit different versus ladybugs where it's not like you have native beneficial nematodes. Ne nematodes are just these parasitic microscopic worms that help hunt down and kill larvae of many of the pests that we want to get rid of in the soil. So what I'm going to do is I am going to do a couple cycles of drenching in that soil um, and I am going to solarize too. Um, I'm still going to decide if I'm going to do both. It might be one or the other, but I am definitely going to proactive, proactively drench with beneficial nematodes in my dahlia area as well as my lisianthus area. Those are two high value crops, neither of which have started blooming. And remember, beneficial nematodes only work in the soil. So it is a proactive measure that you take, hopefully to limit any type of infestation or prevent an outbreak. And if an outbreak has already occurred, you could potentially help break up the reproduction cycle, but for any pests that are already on the bloom, you're not really gonna resolve them with beneficial nematodes. You would need those beneficial predators to come in and eat up those on your blooms. If you're dealing with pests, you are definitely not the only one. I am dealing with pests and it really makes you wonder how much or do people spray, especially if they claim to be farming organically? Because there is no way that people are producing these 
picture perfect stems that are pest free without some sort of spraying unless if they have such a huge area they're doing everything naturally and they're sacrificing the stems that are pest ridden which is really what i'm doing except i don't have a large area um but anyway if this video was helpful for you if i helped you in the past if you've learned something consider joining my patreon i started a patreon a couple of weeks ago and what i do in that patreon is for the cost of a good cup of coffee, so $5, five US dollars a month, you can have access to gated articles. Now, I am now doing complimentary articles for certain YouTube videos. So these articles talk a little bit more specifics. They reference any studies or research papers that I read to be able to inform myself of the topic. And it's typically a deeper dive into a YouTube video that I've done. I also share some other behind the scenes stuff. So everything related to business as well as now pest management, uh, I dive a little bit deeper in my Patreon. So link is also below there. I will be doing another farmer, uh, flower farmer science classroom episode on beneficial nematodes hopefully within the next week or two there's a lot of really interesting stuff about beneficial nematodes that i think we can all benefit from learning a bit more of but anyway let me know in the comments below what pests you're dealing with right now what you're doing to rectify the solution and i see you